Look up Monster from the Ocean Floor in the sci-fi movie guides, and most of the bad things said about it are true. But don't make the mistake of calling it unimaginative, because when it comes to 1950s, 60s sci-fi, it's actually a movie of many firsts. The first where a woman is the brave central figure, predating the fly, I married a monster from outer space, Corman's not of this earth, etc. The first to discuss overpopulation and the need for new food sources, pre-tarantula and beginning of the end. The first and only one to mention aqua farming, before the underwater city. Even the first to feature a flesh-eating blob, before the blob. And the title character, a giant one-eyed amoeba terrorizing a Mexican fishing village, is the first movie monster rendered huge by atomic radiation, before them famously inspired a slew of such pictures. It was also the first movie ever produced by Roger Corman, made when he was still such an unknown that at least one 1953 trade paper listed him as Robert Corman. The profits that Corman reaped from the sale and release of Monster from the Ocean Floor may even have helped set the course for his future horror and sci-fi movie career. So if you're grateful for all the crab monsters, buckets of blood, and Pope pictures that followed, then tip your hat, or your scuba mask, to the movie that started it all. I recently did a telephone interview with Roger Corman about this movie, and we'll play that now. My first question for him was, where was he in his career in 1953, when he made Highway Dragnet and Monster from the Ocean Floor? Highway Dragnet with Richard Conti and Joan Bennett was a crime drama that I thought Roger produced, because he gets an on-screen producer credit, but it turns out he didn't. I'll let him tell the story. I didn't produce Highway Dragnet. I had written a script for Highway Dragnet, and uh, it was incidentally, it was called The Houghton's House in the Sea when I wrote it, and I sold it uh, to, al to allied artists, sold the script, and went along as associate producer. And I took the money from the sale of, uh, of Highway Dragnet, and so a Monster from the Ocean Floor was actually my first uh, uh, producer credit. Okay, how did you end up with a producer credit on Highway Dragnet then? Just sort of one of those bogus... No, no. When I sold the script, uh, I said I'd like to work for nothing if uh, the producer would give me an associate producer credit and I would work for nothing as his assistant. Mm -hmm. And he said, fine, he had nothing to lose. And it gave me um, a little bit of an education in, in production. Oh, absolutely. And please talk about how you came up with the idea for Monster from the Ocean Floor. All right. I had made a little money from from uh, Highway Dragnet, and I was just looking around for ideas now uh, to make a picture because I had, uh, as a result of Highway Dragnet, I had an associate producer and writer credit, so I was officially a producer and writer. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew I wanted to do something in a science fiction vein, and I saw a picture of this one-man submarine uh, that had been developed by a company called Aerojet General, and I thought that was a good, a good uh, prop or vehicle for a picture because I knew I would have very little money, and this really looked quite good. So I called them, said I was a producer, and would like to come over and see it and talk to them. And I said to them, uh, I'd like to use this in my picture after I saw it, and uh, uh, I'll give, it'll give you a lot of publicity. And uh, they said yes, and so I took the money I had from Highway Dragnet uh, raised a little, little more money, raised actually $12,000. And I got a lab deferment from Sid Solo at Consolidated, um, which gave me, he called me completely out of the blue, invited me to lunch, and uh, said he would give me a, a lab deferment. And I figured with the $12,000 and the lab deferment, if I could defer a few more things, they only part for music and part later on and so forth, I could make the picture. Mm -hmm. And I shot the picture in six days uh, on the beach at Malibu with a couple of days of underwater shooting at Catalina. Okay, very good. Um, when you saw the uh, the one-man sub at Aerojet General, did you see it like just in their factory, or did you actually get to see it in, in operation? 
No, I, it was there. I didn't see it in operation, but they said they had tested it and it worked, and I took their word for it. <laughs> did you ever, during the shooting of the movie, did you ever use it or? or, or oh anything? yes, we definitely used it. No, I mean, did, did you personally use it? Did you oh, try no. it? No, no I, I didn't because uh, uh, it. Uh, it required a little more technical expertise, and it was just a one-man sub. Gotcha. And supposedly your outline was called, It Stalked the Ocean Floor. Do you happen to remember if that's correct? Yes. I called it, It Stalked the Ocean Floor. I made a deal with Lippert uh, Releasing, which was a small uh, independent uh, distribution company, and uh, they paid me a fair amount of money, uh, considerably more than the fi the final cost of the picture with deferments and everything was about thirty thousand dollars and they paid me uh, sixty thousand dollars plus a, a distribution percentage and uh, uh, Bob Lippert uh, thought it stocked the ocean floor was too arty a uh, title yeah he changed it from uh, to monster from the ocean floor uh, actually I, I still like it stocked the ocean floor but it wasn't important mm -hmm. and I said okay all right. In your autobiography, you tell a funny story about your parents being uh, two of the people you went to for the money early on and what their reaction was. Would you mind retelling that? Yes. Uh, they encouraged me, but my father said, you're on your own. Uh, they had said to me when I gra graduated from college that uh, they had paid for everything, including my college education and everything else, but now I was on my own. And I thought that was, they said the same thing to my brother, and I thought that was perfectly fair. Mm -hmm. I understood, and now it was up to me. However, my father uh, kept the books uh, on Monster from the Ocean Floor. Oh, great. <laughs> Do you mind at me no cost. At, at no cost. Do you mind me reading you very it's very brief what Wyatt Ordung said in a Fangoria interview about the, the money raised for Monster from the Ocean Floor and I'd love to have you react to this. All right. This is Wyatt Ordung. I raised the money. The whole picture cost thirty nine thousand dollars. We did the initial shooting for nineteen thousand with Academy Award winning cameraman Floyd Crosby. And incidentally, Corman was living at home with his parents at this time. I raised all the money. I hocked my life insurance policy. I hocked my home. Uh, and, I, and the Fangoria interviewer, Johnny Legend, asked, well, what did Corman do on the film? And Ordung answered, he drove the truck. Well, that, of course, is totally untrue. Mm -hmm. but I don't want to get into any uh, dispute with Barney because it was the only picture he ever directed. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was an assistant director. What happened was this. I had the money from uh, the sale of Highway Dragnet. I had a little more money that I had raised from the college classmates at Stanford. And Wyatt Ordog, his name was Barney, uh, Barney came in and uh, said uh, I, uh, he was an assistant director. And uh, uh, would I have a chance of... Uh, We'd, uh, hiring him as director and I said I'm three thousand dollars short on my budget if you'll put up three thousand um, dollars you can direct <laughs> and so therefore I got the final three thousand dollars of the twelve to make the picture and I got a director for nothing he had a percentage I gave him a percentage of the profits so so he did uh, he did fairly well right and here's from a 1979 interview with Floyd Crosby, which I don't think was ever published, uh, conducted by a fellow named Mark Lamberti. He asked about Monster from the Ocean Floor, and the first thing out of Floyd Crosby's mouth was, it was the only picture I worked on that was made without any direction. Wyatt Ordung was his name. <laughs> <laughs> I will have no comment on that. <laughs> All right. And your screen then you can use Floyd's uh, comment because it's pretty close to accurate. Okay, terrific. And William Danch, I looked him up on the uh, on the internet. And he looks like he wrote a lot of radio shows and cartoons for little kids and nothing else professionally that I can see. How did the, how did you end up with Mr. Danch as your uh, screenwriter? Uh, uh, I had a little office. Uh, above the cock and bull on Sunset Boulevard, and there are other offices in the building. And Larry Cruikshank was an agent, and I wrote the outline for Monster from the Ocean Floor, but not the script. 
and uh, Bill Danch was one of his clients, and Bill had never done a screenplay before, and so he agreed to work for a small amount of money and a percentage of the profits also. Mm -hmm. And it was arranged through Larry Cruikshank, his agent. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just for fun, if you don't mind, just to, to, to show the world how far you've come, would you describe your cock and bull restaurant office on Sunset Boulevard as it looked in 1953? What, what kind of place are we talking about? It wasn't even an office. It was the uh, reception room to uh, another literary agent uh, who was very small time and uh, just worked by himself, but he had a reception uh, a room, uh, sort of an entrance to get into his office, and I rented the reception room. Mm -hmm. so people came through my office in order to see him. It was uh, probably the least pre least impressive office of a producer that I'm aware of. <laughs> Funny. And how long did you have that arrangement? I mean, like years later when you were making pictures for AIP, were you still in the same office there? Uh, I... Eventually, after the, after the money I made on Monster from the Ocean Floor, there was a suite of offices there. They were all very inexpensive. So I then took uh, one, uh, a one-room uh, office for myself there and uh, made my first few films from that one-room office. Gotcha. And who cast the movie? Do you have any memories of the casting process? I cast it myself. Um, there were a couple of there were a number of agents, sort of small independent agents, in this little uh, uh, in the in the floor above the cock and ball. And I talked to several of the agents there and cast it through them. And I thought Stuart Wade. I looked him up, and he was a former singer. And I'm a, um, whose idea was it for him to sing a song in the movie? I'm going to guess that it was his. Him. It was his. Yeah, that's right. And did you have any objection to that, or you thought it would work? I, I had no objection. I thought, why not? All right. And uh, what was, do uh, you have any memory of your first sci-fi leading man? Do you have any memory of what he was like as an actor? I thought he was good. Uh, I thought Ann Kimball, mm. uh, the leading lady, was actually carried the film. Mm. Uh, Stuart Wade was good. I thought uh, Ann was extremely good. Uh, and she had a little bit of a career. She did a number of things after that. And uh, we cut... Uh, the film to feature Anne uh, over the other people in the film simply because she was uh, the best actor. Oh, absolutely. Although Stewart, Stewart was good. He was fine. Mm -hmm. But Anne, for a little picture shot in six days, uh, gave a, a fully professional and good and good performance. Oh, I, I absolutely agree with you. Stewart Wade actually looked, to me, he looks a little like Robert Ryan. So he had a good look and he, he was certainly pleasant in the part, but. Uh, Monster from the Ocean Floor is like not of this earth, where um, where the the leading lady is the one who you know picks up the ball and carries the ball, and the leading man is like, "Be careful, honey!" throughout the whole movie, <laughs> and the girl does all the uh, the monster fighting. Right, uh, Floyd Crosby. Can you tell me, say something nice about Floyd Crosby? How you got met him and worked with he him? He was recommended to me. Um, I don't remember exactly. Uh, who recommended him? I think it was an assistant director who had worked with him and told me Floyd's story, which was very interesting. He had won the first Academy Award ever given for, I think the picture was called Taboo. It was a silent film uh, by, I think, Flaherty, a semi-documentary shot in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. He uh, was semi-blacklisted. He wasn't really blacklisted, but uh, his name had come up in some of those congressional hearings and so forth, and he wasn't getting the work that he should have had because there were certain studios that wouldn't hire him. Other studios would hire him. For instance, he did uh, High Noon, mm. uh, the Gary Cooper uh, a, a classic western, uh, but he would have times where he wasn't working between his regular work and uh, he, he simply wanted to work, of course, and, and make some money. Mm -hmm. So I was aware of this that uh, I was able to get for the small amount of money I had to pay an extremely good cameraman mm -hmm. because of the uh, because of his political situation. Gotcha. If you don't mind me reading to you again while you give your voice a rest. In that 1979 unpublished interview, Floyd Crosby says, The assistant art director on High Noon 
put some money in Roger's first film, and he recommended me to Roger. I think that's what it was. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't an assistant director. It was the art director. All right. Yeah. Roger, Roger asked me what my salary was, and when I told him, he said, oh, I can't pay that. But then he said, I can pay you so much, and then when I sell the picture, I'll make up the difference. I said, okay, you got a deal. He always went on a picture for as little money as he could, but he never went back on a deal. He was completely honest. Yes, Floyd, uh, Floyd, we did that, and the picture did make money, and uh, that was one of the deferments that uh, raised the cost from 12000 uh, 12, to 30000 Gotcha. And he said he did 40 to 60 setups a day on pictures like Monster from the Ocean Floor, which sounds terrific to me. Yes. And um, if you don't mind me reading, continuing to read, he adjusts for a little bit. Then the second film Roger did was a co-direction between John Ireland and Ed Sampson, a film editor. And obviously here he's talking about The Fast and the Furious. Yeah. After those two, Corman decided that if, he, that if he couldn't direct as well as those two guys, he'd better get out of the business. <laughs> <laughs> so his third picture was Five Guns West, which he directed. I have done at least six pictures with men doing their first direction jobs, and Roger Corman is one of the best directors I ever worked with doing their first picture. He knew how to do it right from the start. He observed so carefully and was so bright, he knew how to direct right from the start. Well, that's nice. Yeah. And obviously you worked with him time after time, right into the, um, into the Poe pictures, etc. Yes, right. You were 27 years old in 1953 when you made Monster from the Ocean Floor. Right. How many 27-year-olds were doing what you were doing in Hollywood at that time? I would think very few. <laughs> I would too, absolutely. And getting back to Crosby, he'd been in the business for years, and once the movie started shooting and he found himself working with a first-time producer, you, and a first-time director, Ordung, did he step up to the plate or help, and help in any ways above and beyond, or did he just stay behind his camera? No, he, uh, uh, he stayed behind the camera, but Barney really... As he said, uh, Floyd said, I wouldn't say this, Floyd said there was no director. Yes. Uh, Barney was not, uh, I, I, I want to be pleasant to Barney, so I don't, I don't want to say anything. Uh, let's just say this, Floyd helped Barney a great deal. He did more than be the cameraman. He really was helping Barney set up all the shots and the camera angles and so forth. Great. And can you talk about what you, I mean, according to Ordung, you just drove the truck, but obviously it, it sounded like you were a real workhorse on this picture. Would you mind just briefly telling what your job was, your jobs were morning and evenings on this movie? Well, of course, uh, I was doing, uh, I, I was essentially, uh, as a producer, I was the producer, and uh, I was doing a lot of work. Uh, helping the grips. I was sort of a second grip, a second prop man. I even played a little bit of a role. Mm -hmm. I was just working all day long, uh, filling in because we had a very small crew. And whenever, buddy, whenever anybody was needed to do something, I would do that. So at various times I was working, uh, uh, helping to move the camera as an assistant cameraman, uh, helping with the sound man, helping uh, more specifically with the grips and the electricians and prop men. I help with wardrobe. In other words, I was just working all day long in everything. And the driving of the truck was this. Uh, we didn't have, oh, there's a whole story behind that. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was this. I, we didn't have a time, we didn't have money for a Teamster. Everything was working out of one truck. So I drove, I rented a truck and drove the truck. And what I would do, I would drive the truck to the location before the crew arrived. And I would unload everything but the heaviest equipment off the truck I, before the crew got there to save on overtime and um, uh, give more time really to working on the picture. When the crew arrived, the grips with me still working, helping them, would unload the heavy equipment on the truck. And then we would be working on all the different things during the day. And at the end of the day, the grips would load the heaviest equipment onto the truck and everybody would go home and I would stay and load all everything else onto the truck and drive it home. Mm. I didn't get much sleep because I uh, I had to be there before the crew and stay there after the crew. Yes. Right. Did, did you ever manual you know manual labor wise? Did you ever work harder on any movie? 
No, I think that was the hardest. I was working with the, the submarine, too. I was steadying it in the water and pushing it around. And In other words, I was just doing every possible job where, because we had such a small crew, where somebody needed help. Wow. And was Ordung correct that you were still living at home with your parents when you made this movie? Yes. Uh, with the profit from that, uh, I was able to get an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I, I had been unemployed before that. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood Reporter, um, I'm sure you remember back in the old days, and maybe they still do it, at the end of the week they, told, um, they ran a list of what movies were in production and where they were shooting, and um, they listed it as being a foreign film being made in Ensenada, Mexico. Do you have any idea of what, how they came up with that idea? Uh, it might have been this. Uh, I, w I had a union crew, but I was a little short of what I was supposed to be, and they called me and wanted some information, and I really didn't want to publicize this picture too much. Mm -hmm. the, the union would come out and see that I wasn't really working. As a matter of fact, Talking about the truck driver, uh, one union did come out. The Teamsters came out, one guy from the Teamsters, and he said, who's driving the truck? And I said, I am. And he said, you're the producer? And I said, yes. And he said, you're driving the truck? I said, yes. And he laughed. He was a good guy. And he said, all right, Roger, for this picture only, you are an honorary member of the Teamsters, <laughs> and you can drive the truck, but on your next picture, you have to hire a Teamster. And I said, yes. You know, when people hear so much about how rough and tough and bad guys the Teamsters were, I always got along well with the Teamsters, particularly they remembered uh, that I drove the truck on the first picture. That is funny. And uh, according to the Hollywood Reporter also, the shooting title was The Sea Demon. Does that ring any bells at all? Uh, I think I was try really trying to, I didn't even want it to be in the uh, list of pictures shooting, frankly. Gotcha. So I was doing everything I could uh, to sort of disguise it. I had a different title. I said I was shooting in Mexico, all of that stuff. I really didn't even want to be in there, mm -hmm. but they somehow found out I was shooting and called. So I made up uh, all this stuff so that uh, what was in the reporter wasn't uh, really accurate. Gotcha. And then um, anytime we see people on the beach, etc., that's Malibu. And anytime we see people underwater, that's the waters off Catalina Island. Exactly. Terrific. And can you talk about, I'd love to hear about the shooting of those underwater Catalina um, scenes with, um, according to Ann Kimball, a guy named Al Hansen doing the ph photography yeah. underwater. He uh, did some un underwater photography, and he lived in uh, in Catalina, and it was a time when before uh, lightweight scuba gear. He had a full uh, diving uh, system, and he had a, an underwater camera. And I made a deal with him, and we shot uh, we shot off Catalina. The only problem was uh, the water. It wasn't as clear as it should have been. Uh, even then, there was pollution in the water. Oh, really? Yeah. And when you talk about old-time diving gear, do you mean like those canvas suits and the big round metal helmets and all that kind of stuff? Exactly. That's what he had. Wow. Ann Kimball said the water was freezing. Do you recall that? It was cold. Yeah, it was shot in October. <laughs> Yeah. And is it actually, I mean, I can see Ann Kimball's face through the scuba mask, so I know it's her underwater a lot of the yeah. time. Was it also Stuart Wade underwater? Yes, I think uh, I think uh, we had them both there. Wow. And you probably, probably both of them had to go out and learn how to do this stuff before, yeah. before they could make your movie. Right. Wow. Um, that's just, to me, that's so ambitious for, for a guy doing his first movie on no money to have extensive underwater scenes. Well, I think it was only two or three days. I think it was two days of underwater scenes, uh, and I'd heard that he had done, uh, that Al had done uh, underwater photography. As a matter of fact, I called him and asked to see some of it, and it seemed perfectly good. And it was more of sort of home movies or documentaries that he would be making himself. It wasn't really fully professional work. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if I'd had to call, hire a professional underwater crew, it would be way beyond my budget. Gotcha. 
So the two days spent underwater, you're counting those in the six days that the movie no, took? No, I should say six days plus the two days underwater. Gotcha. Okay. And on a movie like this, were there any such things as watching dailies or some of the other niceties of picture making or, uh, or no? No, I don't think so, because we shot everything at Malibu. We had no place to go to see the dailies. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an editor, and I would call him and ask him if there were any problems. He would be uh, uh, in the editing room and seeing the dailies, but we would be working, you know, from the time the sun went up to the time the sun went down, and uh, there was just no time. Uh, to get to a projection room. Gotcha. And your editor, according to the credits, would be Edward Sampson, who co-directed your next picture, The Fast and the Furious. Right. Okay. And Alfred Hansen gets a, uh, instead of underwater photographer, he gets the on-screen credit of technical advisor. Do you have any memory of why why he got that credit? He, wa he wanted that credit. I said, what credit would do you want? It made no difference to me. Right. And he, wa he wanted that credit. No? Well, good for him. To me, the, the, the most striking scene in the whole movie is the scene where Ann Kimball's underwater, or the girl is underwater, I should say, and all of a sudden the shark starts swimming past her repeatedly, and she's stabbing at it with her knife, and my God, where, where did you get your, where'd you get the shark, and uh, how did, do you have any memory of doing that scene? I remember it vaguely, and I'm not certain Anne did that herself. Oh, she did not. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Right. You, you wanted her to, but she kind of put her foot down, according to her. <laughs> yeah, she was not a dumb girl. Uh, no. <laughs> now, how do, you, how, do you get a, how do you get a shark to, uh, to circle somebody for a movie? Or would that be a better question I for Al Hansen? I think Al uh, sort of threw out bait or so, uh, in the water to attract uh, the shark. And um, but it was a small shark, and uh, there are certain sharks that are not particularly man-eating. Okay. Uh, and by throwing out bait, the shark was intent really on, on getting fed, not uh, bothering to go after humans. Gotcha. And according to Kimball, the, uh, the girl in that scene is Al Hansen's wife, who was also a deep-sea diver. That could be. And who's, whose idea was it for Wyatt Ordung to play a prominent role in the movie on top of also directing? It was his idea. We didn't have very much money, and he had uh, done a little bit of work as an actor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said, uh, I think he probably just thought it would be nice. He wanted to act, and we could save some money on a role. Did the weather cooperate? Yes, we had no problems. To my memory, I don't think we had problems with weather. Uh, we had some heavy clouds a couple of days, and it was a little colder than we thought, but it wasn't, wasn't anything unbearable. Okay. And um, again, from Ordung, if uh, I'll give your voice a rest for 30 seconds, a man named Jack Milner saved that picture. If it wasn't for him, there'd be no monster from the ocean floor. The sound somehow was recorded at different speeds than the picture. When we first saw it, Roger Corman, I thought he was going to die in the projection room. Jack Milner recut the sound word for word. He is the hero of that picture, one of the most beautiful men God ever created. Do you have any memory of that? Yes, I, I don't remember exactly what it was. I, to me, it was simply some of the uh, sound was out of sync, and uh, Jack was a sound editor, and he was able to cut uh, and put the uh, put the the portions of the dialogue that were out of sync, put it back into sync. About the distribution, your brother Gene Corman once told me when I interviewed him years ago that Herbert Yates of Republic had an interest in distributing the movie, but then Robert Lippert stepped up to the plate. And what can you tell me about dealing with Lippert? Um, Lippert was, uh, had been a former theater owner, and he had a small distribution company handling uh, reissues of old, uh, bigger films and uh, new, low-budget films. He produced a number of them himself. He was a very sharp guy, and I got along well with him. <laughs> and Gene told me a story of Lippert agreeing to pay out $110,000 for the movie, but then later at the very last minute when people were sitting down to sign contracts, he reduced the amount a bit with the excuse, well, I found out it didn't cost as much to make as you told me it did. I, I think that's correct. Has that always been one of the perils of the picture business, those kind of last-minute uh, renegotiations? <laughs> They happen. They don't happen all the time, but they happen enough uh, to make you get fairly upset about it. <laughs> okay. And he changed the title from Monster from the o to Monster from the Ocean Floor, and I've got right. a feeling the success of Creature from the Black Lagoon, a half-alike title, um, might have um, been in the back of his mind when uh, when he did that. 
And uh, in your autobiography, you wrote that you saw it in the theater on Hollywood Boulevard and found it rather audacious and funny. So you thought it played well when you saw it with an audience? Yes, I, th I thought it played fine. It was obvious that this was a low-budget film, but uh, that type of low-budget science fiction film was fairly popular. That's essentially the reason I made the film. I knew that with science fiction, you didn't need stars. The creature mm -hmm. was the star, and it played well. I, it was no nothing great, but it, the audience seemed to enjoy it, and it seemed to be uh, seemed to be fine. On your own, for old times' sake, how often do you reach? for the DVD shelf and watch one of your own movies with no prompting, no reason to watch it, just, I haven't seen that in years, let me watch one of my own movies. Does it ever happen? Very seldom. Occasionally I will, but essentially I made the picture, I saw it when it came out, there's no reason to see it again. Every now and then I'll uh, maybe take out one of the Poe films or something like that and look at it. Oh, great. And in a 1964 interview, you said of Monster from the Ocean Floor, it cost me about 18000 and grossed 300000 That did it for me. I was in the business of directing scare pictures from then on. The field was wide open for newcomers. So was Monster from the Ocean Floor really that influential in your career? Do we have that movie to thank for all of the sci-fi and horror pictures that followed? Not really. I may have been misquoted because my very next film was The Fast and the Furious, which was a road racing picture, and the picture after that was Five Guns West, which was a western. Mm -hmm. But I did come back, because I think the picture after that was The Day the World Ended, which was a science fiction monster film again. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, so I think I was misquoted because I don't believe I would have said that. What I probably said was, uh, this was a genre I kept coming back to. Gotcha. And in your autobiography, you said that you loved every minute of Monster from the Ocean Floor. Um, and then you kind of gave the impression that loving the making of that movie so much was really what got you hooked on uh, filmmaking. Um, is that going too far? Uh, it's not going too far. It was fascinating, and I was working, as I said, I was doing ten jobs <laughs> every day. I was in the grip department, I was in the sound department, I was a, I was a teamster, uh, I was uh, helping with wardrobe, uh, I w was helping with the submarine. You know, I was working all day long, and it was fun. Fabulous. You know, I've, I've, over the years I've interviewed you now and then about a whole bunch of individual movies, and this by far... This is the movie you remember the most about. I, I get the feeling it is kind of near and dear to your heart. Yes, indeed. It, that's my first, uh, my first production. Now that you've heard Roger Corman's main memories about Monster from the Ocean Floor, 